Now we're going to jump forward to 1835, and we're going to talk about a couple of new characters. Um, by the way, Green DeWitt is, is deceased now. He died of cholera, I believe, in Monclova or Saltillo when he was down there working with the state government. Uh, one of the new players is Cos, Martin Perfecto de Cos. He's the commanding general of the internal states of the East, so he actually is the military commander of three Mexican states. And at the time that all this was going on, he was actually headed towards Bay Hodder. He was coming up there to try to calm things down. He was bringing troops. And another player is this gentleman. He was a colonel. Even though he's called commanding general, he was a colonel, Domingo de Ugartechia. And he was stationed in Bay Hodder. So he's the commander at Bay Hodder. And then we have another military man, uh, uh, Francis Francisco de Castaneda. He's a lieutenant in the Mexican Army. And we also have Jose Angel Navarro. He's alcalde or the mayor of Bay Hodder. He's not the political chief like Musquiz was, but he's the mayor. Then we have a couple of, of gentlemen from Gonzales. I believe it's Andrew Ponton. He's the alcalde of Gonzales. And then we have Joseph Clements. He's the regidor. He's one of the city councilmen is what this is. So we got these new characters. Now we're going to go to September 21st, 1835. Navarro writes Alcal uh, uh, Ponton, uh, the alcalde uh, in Gonzales, and there has been some, some military upset people. There have been some, a little bit of small actions. Mostly there was a naval battle between two ships, Mexican and Texans, and the Mexican ship was captured. So there's this strife, and so he's saying now that Colonel Ugartechia reclaims the cannon. He says, send it back to us, and, he, and this is, remember, Angel Navarro, who was the, uh, the mayor of Bejar. And we have a response from Ponton back to Navarro from September 27, 1835, and this is a great letter. I love this one. Ponton, who's a politician as far as I can tell, he's mayor there in, in Gonzales, he said, he responds, I love this part, he said, I received an order purporting to have come from you. Like, I don't know if it really came from you, like somebody else would write him demanding Miss Cannon. And he, he goes on to say that in consequence, the men who bore the cannon, which by the way, um, the Mexicans, Ugartechia, sent a corporal and four privates to get the cannon. So these guys show up said they, and they present this letter to Ponton and they say, we want the cannon back. And he says, those men, because we didn't know what to do, those men were detained until today waiting for an answer. He said, I wasn't there at the time, so we had to detain them. And he says, as I understand, this cannon was given in perpetuity and it, this should be permanent. Now, you remember only four years before, the documents clearly stated that the cannon would come back to Bay Hodder if requested, but they have conveniently forgotten that, uh, that piece of information. Of course, now, DeWitt's dead, so they could argue, well, we didn't see the papers or something along that line. Ponton, uh, uh, his document was translated by Navarro and sent to Ugartechia the same day he got it. So this is another document that basically says the same thing. Now Navarro, the mayor, uh, responds to Ponton that very same day, and he says, I need to tell you that this indicated cannon was lent to the deceased Green DeWitt, and it says down at the bottom, he says that in case you don't deliver said cannon, he will send forces to take it. So we're starting to ramp up the energy here, we're starting to, to talk tough a little bit. So Ponton's getting two notes. Ugartechia says the same thing. He said this was a borrowed cannon. And he says, I'm sending Lieutenant Castaneda to march with a hundred cavalrymen and to get that cannon. And he says at the bottom, you will be solely responsible for all incidents if you don't give up the cannon. So now we're starting to get a little bit more 
macho or ramped up here. We're talking force now. We're sending a hundred guys. Ugartechia writes to Castaneda. So Ugartechia, the commander, writes to his lieutenant on that same day. And this is what he tells him. Take a hundred dragoons, go to Gonzales, take uh, command of that cannon. And he tells him, make use of force if needed, and take the Alcalde Pontin prisoner, bring him here, and punish anyone who tries to resist. So, so Castaneda's got his orders. Now Castaneda writes two days later, he's obviously gone to Gonzales, and he writes about some interesting occurrences that happen. Castaneda tells Ugartechia that outside, about five miles outside of Gonzales, before they ever got there, they came across two military couriers and with them they had one of the four privates that was originally sent to Gonzales and this private de la, de la Garza he's on foot he's without arms so they didn't just detain him and he told that he tells Castaneda that the Americans disarmed Corporal Casimiro who, uh, uh, who, uh, who was the commander of that little group that was supposed to get the cannon and the privates that accompanied him they were made prisoners, and he said they were, uh, they were finally set free. This guy was set free by order of the Americans. Now, he tells them something very important here, and, and this is huge. He tells Castaneda, who, remember, has 100 troops with him, he tells him there are about 200 Texans gathered there ready to fight. So now all of a sudden, Castaneda is five miles out of town. He finds out he's outnumbered two to one. Okay. Oh, and he, he also says that there were more that are supposed to arrive that afternoon. So now we've, it could be well more than, than 200 Texans there. He goes on to tell him that the Alcalde was absent. It seems like every time a Mexican official showed up that Ponton was absent. But he was going to come and, and treat with him and talk about what was going on in about three hours. He said, I, I didn't want to wait for the results of this conference. I wanted to let you know what was going on right away, and I wanted to make you aware of this. And he signs off that he's within sight of the village of Gonzales. The Texans were in a great position because the Mexicans were on the south side of the river, and Gonzales was on the north side of the river, and the Texans, of course, had taken all the rafts and canoes and everything. So. So the Mexican army really had no way to get across the river. The Texans controlled it, so they couldn't enter Gonzales easily. Now we have Ugartechio's response to Castaneda. Now, now we're a, a day later, and Ugartechio is telling Castaneda what to do because now he knows as well that Castaneda is outnumbered. So he said, if you know positively that the combined resistance forces are superior to the, your forces, uh, you are to retreat. So he didn't want him to attack and, and get whipped there. That would not serve any purpose. So he said, go ahead and retreat if you can uh, find out positively that you're outnumbered. I know there's a lot of documents, but I think there's a lot of great information in here. Ugartechia now also writes his boss, General Coase. And General Coase now has gotten all the way to Goliad. This is September 30th, 1835. Coase is on his way to Behar, and he's made it to Goliad. So that's where this letter uh, 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 reaches Coase. And in it, now, all of a sudden, this is great, um, Ugartechia writes Coase and tells him that it's an eight-pounder, eight-pound cannon. And it's, it was of excellent class. It's not only an eight-pounder, but it's a, a, an excellent condition. And he says this, he mentions the, the battle between the two ships, between the Correo and the San Felipe. And he said this piece could be used against us. And, and uh, he said he's starting to send copies of all the documents that he has, that Ugartechia has. And the first document he sends him he, he says in that document, he said, not believing that there would be any motive to negate the, the delivery of one piece of artillery that didn't belong to that village, he just sent four soldiers, five soldiers, and a cart to bring it back. He said, I never dreamt they wouldn't give it back to us. And uh, then he goes on and talks about the other documents. And at the very end, 
and this is this is to me a, a big moment in Texas history. At the very end of this note, he says, "I'm sending this by special messenger, as the colonists have already declared war." So now we have the mention of war. That's the first time I found it in any of these documents. Just to show you what an 1820 eight pounder would look like. This It's about six foot barrel. It weighs 2,000 pounds or more and it has a huge four inch bore. So we're pretty sure this was not likely to be an eight pounder. Now the Mexicans are starting to exaggerate here. Okay, um, Ugartechia writes Coase on the 30th and this is, a, this is a separate letter from the last one and now he's starting to get inflamed. Ugartechia, remember, he's in Behar and he's writing Coates, Coates, who's at Goliad. He says, I have reliable information without a doubt of the bad faith of the colonists. He said, the horrible views of those colonists is the denial of that cannon. And he goes on to say, the only thing that remains is that they be declared positively as enemies. He says, uh, he mentions some foreigners from Gonzales that want to go back there. One of them was Dr. Smithers, but we don't need to get into that. But he mentioned that there were some people that wanted to go think, try to calm things down. 